and then I uh, and um, I uh, got a job just one day a week at Present Moment Herbs, which was Bob Gallagher had opened then in 19. He might have opened in 80. Yeah, and I, I started working in 81. Yeah, so uh, and we had we had people right from the start, and um, I've been trying to find people who really remember back. I know Jean was actually there, remembers that one was one room. Anybody else remember that store? One room? No, I think even Bob. So Bob remembers you came, it was two rooms by then. There wasn't the back room yet, but um, there was the big side room. Uh, he took over the Calamity Jane had it there before they moved on. Yeah, and then um, two of my er if not three, my earliest students, I would say, well, no, these would certainly be very, very early. Martin and um, Vince, um, I, you guys might be earlier than these. Yeah. So, I mean, I remember for sure teaching in the store there, Vince and Martin. And I remember the day that I, I was running across the university and my um, foot came down on the side rather than, and I heard this click, 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 like the tendons were just, and, and then I fell, my knee hit on that side. And I had a class at present moment that night. So, and both you guys were in that. I think you guys actually kind of carried me back to the White House. <laughs> and uh, with Joyce Eiler's house, right, Lieutenant. And, um, but I put, I slathered um, Arnica all over it. And um, I, the next morning I woke up and I got out of bed and it was like, maybe I, I could stand on it. Like, and I, I could, off to the room table, and then a friend, Barbara Young, some of you might remember her if you were involved in the uh, more out there in uh, um, Minnetrista, uh, Minnetonka, West Tonka. Um, she called right at that instance, and I said, God, I can't believe this. It, it doesn't hurt. I, I can walk on it. Yeah, she said, yeah, if you get to, um, but my knee hurt, and that never got better for about eight, nine months. But where I, and, he, and she said, yeah, if you put on arnica immediately, you just get magical results. Like the next day, it doesn't work as well as just instantly, right? You know, and it was also one of those God, this stuff really works. I mean, you know, it probably helped, you know, five thousand people by then, and and, uh, and it was like, oh my God, it really works. <laughs> but uh, and really, I can't tell any problem with that foot. I mean, I, after a couple months, there's just no problem with it. Whereas the knee held on, and it was actually. I worked at Mary Rutherford's chiropractic clinic and there was a woman who did neuromuscular. She just she had good sharp fingers and just got went in there and got rid of the stagnant, the congealed blood, which I would know how to do nowadays, but I didn't even know what the problem was. I didn't know as much, but that would be different. You know, other herbs for blood that just sat there for a long time, actually, yarrow wouldn't be a bad thing, but I didn't know anything but yarrow in those days, and, but uh, arnica in those days. And, uh, but I remember you guys, so I got to, Present moment, I was limping more and more, and I taught my class. And at the end, I was like, "Could you guys like take me home?" And like, and I think I had to be supported by both you guys uh, going to the back door of the. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Were you in that class at all? Probably not. No. Yeah. And and um, yeah, you guys had to kind of yeah, take me in there. And on the third day, I could jog again. It's like holy oh, cow! I mean, it was just unbelievable how good that. The arnica was so it was amazing to watch you go through your home traffic <laughs> selection in the back of the five minutes <laughs> with what maybe five minutes you were back in the home oh. traffic. Oh, really? Did I take more than the arnica? Yeah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> probably really bad at arnica. Well, the main thing I think was slathering the the mm -hmm. homeopathic the uh salmon, and that was Barbara's point too is like. Yeah, I've had times when I like uh, got bruised and I put the arnica on here and then up here there was a bruise. I didn't see it till the next day and I couldn't get that, you know, and that would go away. It was that getting it on right away. So how many people here have used arnica with great? Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and it could be a lifesaver sometimes. So, yeah. So, um yeah, so I'm sure there's other people. So by the time our, our store is expanding a little bit, we have uh, 
So that was kind of, so back in those days, and in fact, before when it was still just the single room, which was pretty small, um, Janda worked there, or Janda, Janda Grove. And um, she worked there about six, seven years. And um, she got mad at Bob one time and quit and she like slammed the door <laughs> and the glass broke and she was a very beautiful person. And, uh, but uh, at any rate, they patched that up. But but so she, about 91 then or so, it was um, me and her decided to, I think it was her idea actually, I was at Arnica Green. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Gina Fortunes needed it, yeah, so. Yeah, um, through no fault of her own, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so she, I think it was, so someone was saying Guild 91, so that was 10 years later. I don't think she was working at present moment. She married the coordinator for Wedge Foods. I don't know if anybody remembers him. Um, and they live in um, Ecuador. You know how people have epics of life that are just completely different. I, she probably still does herbalism, but in a place like that, third world, you probably actually end up doing some herbalism that's you know pretty basic. Um, but she does painting. I think you could look Janda Grove or Janda Grove A or O up online. And uh, but she, I think it was her idea, but. But she and I kind of began it and quickly, I mean, it was like when you found things that like were meant to be, it just boom, like it took off instantly almost. So, so and um, it's been so much fun. We met in that church on Franklin and then that church back there in South Minneapolis. That's, and uh, um, well, yeah, the last couple of years, of course, uh, be due to COVID. We kind of lost track. I don't know. When did you guys start meeting again? Uh, um, monthly meetings again? 22. So it's been about a year and a half or a year. Actually, right. spring, I want to say. Oh, so good. Yeah, that's oh. right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it was a little hard there, but it continued. So let's see. And Erica's here somewhere back there, too. Another student. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Long ago. And, uh, and she teaches, uh, there's a program at the um, Minneapolis Community Technical College, which is one of the only places you get a certificate from a, a real school in the whole country. <laughs> What's that? No. Oh, okay. So is it a one or two year program at this point? Um, it's a two year in Okay. Uh, we'll have to catch up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think about you yeah, a lot, but I, been so busy. You're probably so busy too. You know. God. Lise because, was one of my students back there in the 80s, 90s. She became a full time practicing herbalist. And Erica, at times you were pretty much full time too. Um, but she's a teacher now, a little bit more. I don't know that she can. Yeah. It's um, hard to. Well, all of us. So the secret to being a professional herbalist is be a teacher, make your own products, give herb walks, and teach in classes too. So. You kind of have to do everything because, uh, well, an, an example was when Bob founded that store in 1981. He says it has to be herbs and books because herbs by itself would not make it. And I'd have to say books by itself might not make it either. Now, but, so. <laughs> but that store is doing very well. And I want to compliment his daughter, Selena. So like, you know, the next generation takes over from the last generation and I do not know anybody more um, dedicated to their fathers, to their previous generation's vision than her. I mean, really, I've been around the country. I've never been anybody. It's like, we're going to do it the way Bob did it. I want to, you know, I mean, she has changed it. So but it's really incredible. And anybody who has a legacy, that's, that's, you would be blessed to have, to be able to, to hand, hand that on like that. So I really want to, commend her and she's the younger generation so it's got kind of young blood different but martin still works there and uh martin was one of the so long ago and uh this is so funny i yeah i couldn't understand herbal books and i mean you know menagogue uh astringent mucilage i mean nobody nobody talked like that even in medicine you know 
when I was coming up and you would have had to, um, well, someone like Dr. Christopher, or somebody of that generation would actually have lived when the doctors talked like that. Oh, David Carroll, another person from way back. And you worked at the store for a while, maybe in the 90s. Yeah, or late 80s, 90s, yeah. Yeah, and um, uh, so let's see, what was I saying? Um, what? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, okay, the, the, all that, all those names. Yeah, it was like, huh? but homeopathy could understand because of symptoms, symptoms, symptoms. And it was, I it was a little bit before I started at the store, just a year, maybe I had started at the store. And, no, I don't think I had. And uh, my cousin, in, and uh, this is a reminiscence, my cousin in Philadelphia, Julian Winston, was, uh, kind of, he became a big wig in homeopathy, more of a historian and a social, someone that you always wanted to meet at the, conference because he was just such a delightful person but he he knew the homeopathic wheel of pork and taffle store there on art street before it got i mean it's been like 150 years he's been there and, you know on uh, art street uh, quaker headquarters of the university there, and uh, old old city philadelphia and uh so he gave me there's no internet he gave me the address for pork and taffle and i was just getting ready to to uh uh send off to get a homeopathic home remedy kit. And my dad said, oh, could you get me one of those? I My Uncle Rushmore had one of those. I was like, I never heard about this. Your Uncle Rushmore had one of these? Yeah. Well, and we always said, my grandfather, we had this family store. It was delivered in 1900 in Trent, New Jersey by Quaker. They were Quakers. Chiropractic physician. But it was actually a homeopathic physician. Actually, there were no chiropractic until 1903. So that was not possible, but we figured it out after a while. Wait, okay, um, he was a homeopath in 1903. Well, so, and I grew up with the Quaker meeting there. And, and uh, um, so my dad and I got homeopathic home remedy kits and I helped Bob understand homeopathy. And Martin has really flourished in homeopathy too. So it's kind of funny. I did better with herbalism, like at least to, like you just had the feel for it. Martin and Bob both ended up more a little on the homeopathic side, although you and 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 flower essences too. Yeah. So yeah. So but what, what was I saying? Um, okay. um yeah. I remember when you can believe this. So, you know, those little homeopathic tubes, like they, I mean, homeopathy was so behind on marketing and all that. They, it's probably a hundred thousand dollar a year industry. And so we had our home remedy kits and then the little tubes that were in there. Yes, hold that up. Yeah. Okay. So there was a kit and we, we to stock the store, we had to buy, um, you could buy replacements for wholesale was a dollar a bottle. And there was like 40 of them. They, they were only for the kit. Maybe it was 28 or 32 or something, but but you couldn't actually buy, there was not, none of this homeopathy on shelves after shelves after shelves, none of that. I mean, in fact, their products that they had, we did have them for a while. And they were just like too weird. They were from another generation. There was one I wish we had a uh, burdock seed hair tonic. We had that. And, and now I realize, oh my God, that's a really good remedy. Hard to get. And I don't think anybody in this continent makes it anymore. They usually get it online from Europe. But, um, you know, there are things we didn't know how to sell. And, and I remember some of the old bottles, like they had pasted on the name and it was like, you could tell it was like 30 years old. It was, it was like paper <laughs> that was aged. Like, like nobody bought that brevity enough for them to put a new label on. And um, <laughs> um, so uh, so we started Dollar Rush, just those 32 remedies or so. And, Little by little, we expanded, and little by little, the homeopathic companies caught on. Like, whoa, this is like a marketable product. And boom, you know, and then there's company after company. And now, yeah, I hope they don't get wiped out by the FDA or something. They're they're kind of legally a worse or shit. The FDA could not obliterate them. They could just make them by doctor's prescription only. While the AMA made it so that no doctor can do it. You know, do it use. A little worried about it in Canada maybe first. There's always going to be a black magic. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And also, if they outlaw the name homeopathy, then it'll just become 
geomantic remedies or something, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. So that all grew and the herb shelves grew and the herb companies, when I started there in 1981, there was only one tincture line, if you can believe this, one tincture line. And I and another amazing thing, solar ray may have existed, but Dr. Christopher's line was made in 82 or 83. What? Yeah, but I mean, that line, that would be one of the great herbs in that. And it was not in 1981, his personal, it didn't exist yet. I think he, he was still alive. Well, some of you may remember Linda Rydell, who practiced with Dr. Jones, who was a homeopath. She was herbal. She studied with uh, Dr. Christopher. And uh, oh, going back to way back, um, Tao Foods and Deb, Deborah there, Debbie, Deb, Deborah. She died in car accident. And I mentioned her because she brought in William Lasassier. I, I didn't know him then. I was in my twenties. Great, just a, a genius, like psychic, like. I got it. So I was just out in Boston typing up notes from him. I, my God, I mean, he's, you know, where did he learn all this? But he, I mean, he was psychic and intuitive and like other dimensional, <laughs> had, a, had a founding uh, vision um, where Pythagoras, dressed in all green, stepped out of a golden triangle and handed him a book, was, showed him one page after another. Of the book, I and uh, someone else from my neighborhood that yeah. uh, showed one page after another of of uh, the secrets of medicine. His system. Well, we're trying to. We're if anybody here is a wants to volunteer to work on, uh, yeah, um, we're trying to type up all that, get it on modern virtual reality, and make some books out of it. And what can I say? Uh, there's a shockingly incredible piece of information every paragraph. Uh, it's kind of hard to describe uh, what those uh, were, but um, there were so many I can't remember. But I, I got you know, and, I, and when I I can't share them. I mean, I could share them. If I got to remember them, but I can't give you the printed copy because we're trying to save that so the book comes out. But William was here in the eighties. Yeah, or seventies, seventies, and I'm not. So, um, uh, yeah. So old, old times, and well, I think I left the present moment about ninety two or something. I worked at Mary Rutherford's chiropractic clinic, so maybe the late nineties, and then I had my own office in South Minneapolis. Martin was there too, and that end of um, end of Avenue. And then finally, I moved out to Wisconsin and kind of semi-retired. You got, <clears throat> I still see people, but not, I don't spend, go see uh, Mark. <laughs> I'm semi-retired. But you never, what, you'll never be totally retired. That's not the point of herbal, herbalism is like, there's always more to do and to, like, you have to help people, you know, so. Yeah, I always say I work for the herbs, though, not for uh, the humans. The herbs are way, way more forgiving. <laughs> way more, it's like, yes, I just hold this essence for the last 200,000 years. Yes, it's me, the arrow. I'll do the same thing every day. Even if you don't know me, I totally, I'm there. You know, when a human is like, oh, you know, I wonder what it looks for lunch today. I'm going to think of something new. <laughs> We're so ephemeral and unreliable. <laughs> I decided the the uh, motto on the human coat of arms is "Oops." <laughs> it's like, like what? I wasn't supposed to eat that apple. I'm like what? <laughs> so, which yeah, brings me to my book. That's uh, interpretations of the Book of Genesis stories from a shamanic angle. It's a pretty sophisticated book. It's a pretty sophisticated book. It's really a great book, I think. And I've self-published it. I haven't made a lot of effort to sell it. I had it on Amazon for a while. And uh, now it's just sitting around. But I'll, you know, I'll slowly sell off. Oh, you can get more if you want from me. But these are donated to the guild. So seven, er uh, it's related to the seven herbs book. Except seven guideposts, which I talk about in that book. That's like 
those seven great stories are Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, uh, Noah and the Ark, like who? But um, Abraham and the Ram, really, uh, Isaac, Jacob, and Esau, and Joseph. Yeah. And each one is a great story. Uh, and they are related to ancient stories. Yes, they are more monotheistic. It's interesting, though, in particularly in the names of God in there, they come from different traditions so that it's become monotheistic, but they're actually different gods from different traditions. So the God, so the, the there is a shamanic cycle in there. The first stories are universal themes that appear here and there everywhere in the world to some extent. The last four, four stories are the shamanic cycle, which is um, Abraham, uh, the walk of faith it would be the more Judeo-Christian interpretation, which is true. Like having to give up, give up, and like, what is the promise going to happen when true? Okay, wow, well, we have a son, you know. Well, now go sacrifice him on the mountain. It's like, okay. Like, the famous, uh, the Akita, the Jewish name, the Hebrew name, the, you know, the knife is raised, and then boom, he sees a ram in the thicket, and the uh, angel's voice says, the messenger of God says, it. Abraham, Abraham, look up. And then uh, there's a, the, and he knows there's the ram in the thicket, which is the animal self of 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 um, of, of uh, shamanism. Shamanism, you need to get to know that make peace with that inner animal, and um, um, don't know if I can prove that right off the top of my head, but but uh, um. That's that's what that story, the hidden motif in there. And there's so much um, in the word plays in Hebrew. So maybe I should start at the beginning. Yeah, let's start. I'm going to tell some more stories. So Adam and Eve, yeah, I would say innocent, susceptible to temptation. We're like, that's the oops. Like, we're so impressionable. We're so incompetent, I got to say, as a species. Like, we don't know how to survive like animals, like just in our niche, like, boom, I got it done. Boy, I know what to eat, exactly. It's like, what, I'm not stopping for an apple. Or maybe, you know, apples I live on, but, but uh, so humans, it's like, huh, oh, what, you know? And, um, so there's the tree of life, which is the imagination, the spirit world, dream time, dream time, really. And there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is, good and evil, which is logic. I well, figured it out. It's pretty simple. In fact, the Bible actually says that the old, old Hebrew tale. Oh, who wrote those stories? There's two major authors. I'm quite sure for our feminists in the audience that the main uh, is oral storyteller that someone wrote down. But the J the J section is uh, is almost certainly a, a midwife. Um, and I think the midwives were interested with the stories of the tribe. Because there's so much gynecological information, uh, obstetric gynecological information in the book of Genesis, which you will not find in any other mythology anywhere. I asked a woman, you know, and otherwise it's like, you know, Aphrodite being born out of the head of Zeus or, or you know, some, I mean, it's just mythological birth stories that has nothing to do with actual reach birth and things like that. It's quite detailed. I mean, quite, quite detailed. So. And then we must remember the one of the curse of Eve in in pain shall you bear children. It's like, yeah, how many stories by men would think of something like that? <laughs> um, I, I mean, we wouldn't think of that, frankly. <laughs> I, I can testify. <laughs> what? They have to suffer? What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so so there is a change to it's like a dual state male and female good and evil uh death and life and that's our world and yet there's also still getting trying to get back to the tree of life to that connectedness to the connectedness to the creator and um so animals figure in every single story at the end of the book of, of, of the adam and Eve's story god says adam and Eve are still wearing the Fig leaves, take off those fig leaves and put on animal clothing. We should just think like, oh, they, of course, the ancient Hebrews know about people living in caves with animal skins. I mean, 
when the when the doomsday uh, the census of England in, in 1086 was taken, there were still people living in caves on the Dorset Moors wearing animal skins. Whoa, okay. So, um, so you know, yeah, people are aware of that, but it's more than that. It's like, you are animals, don't lose control. Don't lose connection with that part of you. Yeah, the animals are, and well, we're gonna have no in the ark, the animals are gonna continue to figure. So in the next story, the subtle, the stories are so subtle. The Cain and Abel, Abel presents offerings from the flock, Cain from the vegetables from the fields, and Cain is rejected. It's like, it doesn't tell you, listen to the story of your intuition, watch the pictures. God said, take off those fig leaves, put on the animal clothes. So Abel gets it, and he's thinking, he's seeing in that visionary, intuitive landscape, he's seeing the, the connection there um, to study the animals. Oh, I should say, yeah, I love plants, but they're the they're the bad guys <laughs> for the until after knowing they are. So, um, so it's like, no, uh, the offering from the field is not good. And there's something really interesting there. So logic, the syllogism, was invented like four four hundred and fifty by Plato according to Aristotle. That seems to be true. The a syllogism is. If Socrates is a man and all men are mortal, then Socrates is mortal. So it's an if-then type thing, and our culture is dominated by that perspective. It's like you just tell, you just say, oh, I went out and I saw a bird, and like, yeah, yeah, and then what? Yeah, what did the bird do? It's like we we want this if-then all the time. Mm -hmm. And if-then makes one person, you've got to agree with it. Yeah, do you agree that Socrates is immortal? Or are you, a, are, are you an irrational person that can't see that? In which case we're going to destroy your civilization, and or non-civilization because you're not civilized because you don't talk like us, and that really led to the origin of all these religions that are like we're right, you're wrong, monotheism right in there. It's right about that time that the changes that Judaism becomes much more rigidly monotheistic. Yeah, all these names of God in the Book of Genesis like. El Elyon, that's the that's most high God, that's Zeus, that's the pagan name for the high supreme being. That gets adopted by the Jews. There's a El Shaddai, a God of the mountaintops, God of the wilderness, and that word even means breasts, and there's no doubt that that was originally Artemis, the goddess of the mountaintops, of the wilderness, you know, a female goddess, I mean, she's in charge of them. Childbirth, I don't know about lactation, but she's direct female goddess. So so, um, so there's these different names there that are actually are remnants of earlier perceptions. They've all been kind of made strict into a monotheistic worldview. Well, so this gets going about 450 BC. This, and I had read, I read those Genesis stories so many times that I even studied Hebrew it's like, so I could read them. And um, I'm not very good at it, but um, and lo and behold, I got what Cain says. Well, his face falls. His his offering is not accepted, and he, and God says, but if you you know follow, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Like, wait, wait. This is a syllogism. Like this is like if then. It's like. Oh my God, that's the only time I could find it in Genesis. Except, yeah, so he he doesn't, he, that doesn't work for him either. So his great-grandfather says, if, uh, if Cain could be forgiven seven times, then I could be forgiven 77 times for killing a young man who insulted me. It's like, uh, the syllogism has run amok. Um, and it's become the basis of justifying oneself and also good and evil and see so you, you know and interpreting God through that I would say what works logical um and what's funny to me is that Genesis attributes the origin of the syllogism to God actually to the human being 
but the human didn't follow. So Abel's still kind of adhering to the tree of life, to the vision, to the following, you know, not what you're supposed to do in a moral way, but getting, because it's not explained why should flocks, sacrifices from the flocks be acceptable? Oh, and they say, I like Jewish folklore sometimes, like when uh, Cain killed him with a piece of flint and his dog remained, he was a shepherd, so his dog remained there whining until Adam and Eve found him. So, and they say the crows taught Adam and Eve how to bury him, not to bury him, or what to do for death, because there's only three species, I think, that know death. Crows, humans, and there's one other. I don't know what that one is. But, oh, well, that would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. And uh, crows, it's well known that they actually they teach their young what death is. I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure if that's all blackbirds or just crows. So, But crows really have a language, too. They're really quite intelligent. So they taught Adam and Eve what to be. Where did both go? Then, uh, then no one in the ark. This is so interpretable by Jungian psychology or psychology. Uh, he has about three levels. That's like the unconscious, the conscious, the superconscious, the, the window open on top, the, like open to the supreme being. That's like the new age, the soul star, the golden cord to the above, to the infinite, open through the top. The, the ark was only open on top. And Gathering all the animals, that's like all your psychic forces in your field of energy, so to speak. Uh, William Blake, and I have a lot of interpretations from William Blake, he said, the antediluvians are our energies. Mm -hmm. He understood that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so that's like, we need to gather all that within the integrity of the psyche, which is like that alchemical vase that, that Jung kind of discovered in the alchemical writings, uh, integrity of the psyche. And then, uh, and being a boat, it has four sides, like Jung would have it, that's just supposed. And then the three levels, and then all the animals in the world, four couples, Noah and his wife and uh, three sons, their wives, so it is fourfold. So it represents that, Jung always said, the dream of the four <clears throat> of the cross on the equal side across particularly uh, was a dream or a vision of holism. Oh, right, I wore my, yeah. So Jung came up with that idea basically after he um, visited Taos, he had a like two day stop in Taos. He went by train from Washington. See all these, you know, had to meet all the big, big wig psychologists and then shoot train all the way down to Taos. He made friend, friends with like Indian chief and the the Pueblo there and a few other people. And, um, but, you know, this was the state flag by then. Um, and there's just so many symbols down there of that equal sided uh, uh, cross. And I, I think his ideas developed after that. Okay. Uh, he called it the mandala. Nowadays we call it a medicine, medicine circle. Um, Mandala is a little too esoteric. But so this, this, um, uh, the, um, the arc represents all that. I, I just find these studies so fascinating too. Like, arc, like, what kind of word? I mean, I know enough Hebrew, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I read, oh, it's from the Greek, Argos, the Argonauts, the ship. Argo, Argos in Greek is ship. Well, the Hebrews didn't have any ships. <laughs> so they had to learn that word from someone else. There's a lot of words in there that come from other languages. Like one of the really great ones, so Adam. Yeah, so Adam means, yeah, human, kind of in an archetypal sense. Um, but Adama means primal particles of creation. And like the Hebrews, like Aristotle still, it's like, boom, like the spirit stamps the matter. The matter is unformed, and then there's an archetype, boom, the atom and the adama. But adama means primal particles. It's like our atom. And then 
It's actually like the Sanskrit atma, which means primal particle particles, but it, more in a spiritual sense, like your primal spiritual atom versus our word atom became primal particle in a material sense. And then there it is in the Bible right there. Adam has a different origin, strangely. Um, it's uh, of the blood. Oh, it actually means red man. <laughs> Interestingly enough. Clay. Yeah, yeah, red clay. Right. Yeah. And uh, well, so all these things, so much meaning there. And then, so those are the early stories. And I say, and just like in my book, Seven Herbs, those are the stories you got to develop that. Well, the first thing is you learn your life as a polarity. You got to accept good and evil, life and death. Uh, you got to accept, you know, you got to also reject what's not good and for you and other people. And, but you have to be open that polarity, like, and then coming down for a boat. And that, I think memory, at least honoring the memory in us of the tree of life, like, we're pretty far removed from it. It's like, no, I don't want to play with the imagination and dreams and all that. But you come around to that, it's important in our own personal evolution. And then it's like um, the second story. So the first story is that accepting our temptation, innocence susceptible to temptation. Innocence and experience, as, as William Blake said, books of innocence and experience. And then kind of uh, oh, and I apply these to the laws of homeopathy. The first thing, we're healed by the similar or the contrary. The similar is, again, this is opposites and conjunctions. The similar is the remedy, the doctor signatures or the remedy causes what it cures. And that's the, um, uh, that's the homeopathic remedy or the good herbal at the time. But in herbalism, we also learn contraries cure hot to cold, damp to moist, and I mean damp to, to dry. Yeah, you don't want to give damp to damp. <laughs> and that's not anti-homeopathic. It's just that the homeopaths are a little bit fanatical about their law. And um, it's because what's important is you're on the law, you're on the realm of same and other. And that's the law of the essence. You're still hot to cold. You're still doing the essence. You're still understanding what's going on and treating. Um, and so a lot of contraries, a lot of similars, that's the primal law of healing. I also say the good teacher knows when to, or parent, when to be sympathetic and when to like, no, that's wrong. And, um, this, uh, I don't want to say this one, to both to support and to oppose. So, yeah. So, and then you get the right remedy. So many of you have seen this. You really see these things, like homeopathy is so dramatic. It's like Our Lady of Lords or something. It's like, <laughs> is this a miracle or what? Oh, but then it only works about you know, 10, 20, 30, 50% of the time. Um, and with herbalism, you got to figure it out, kind of. You get, you get better at understanding what's going on. But um, so you give the right remedy, and the, and it, and the body starts to detoxify. And it, the law of direction of cure, you get better from the inside to the outside from top to bottom, um, inside to outside, and from vital to less vital organs. Well, they say that, but I had at least one case where it was so clearly the opposite that I no longer believe that. But yeah, they do say uh, you re-experience uh, injuries in the, like the newer ones and then the older ones and then the very older old ones. But someone had it exactly, and they took teasel, which is a, a remedy that Teasel will create that kind of matrix of reliving. And she relived a lot when I was 10 years old, when I was 15, like in that order. So I do ignore that, but um, have you seen that one validated at all? The, it's it's harder to see it validated too. Yeah, I really look at the person. Yeah, but, but you do see better from inside to out, very definitely, mm -hmm. and top to bottom. And um, from vital to less vital. I mean, that's just so, and so you think you don't know what you're doing with herbs, but that's how you monitor it. You say like, oh, they got a skin rash, but wow, but they're better on their internal things, you know? Like, oh, babies, they're always getting rashes. They're really just 
they're purifying, they're cleaning their bodies out, you know. Mm -hmm. Then you get the antibiotics, and then a month later they have a rash or the next day. But but so they're cleaning out, and that continues into throughout life. And so you don't always if the herb is gentle, you know, or the homeopathic, you don't see it act like that. But a lot of times you will see that cleansing. And then finally you reach the healing crisis. That's no one here. The healing crisis when the like the condition reaches its worst because you have to get it out of your system. So first you get that similar, that electrics like that similar, that oh, that resonance like oh, we're we've connected with the primal injury here. And then then detoxification, and then finally the detoxification reaches its peak. And we have the healing crisis, which is the Hippocratic healing crisis. Um, how much time do we have? Um, it was eight o'clock right now. Oh, am I oh, late then? No, you're fine. Okay. Like oh, okay. Oh, great. Okay. Because, yeah, I love talking about this. So, that, so just an aside here, the homeopathic, you know, the Hippocratic physicians, and they were a school. And there, too, I would have to say, yeah, okay, they're all men, according to the people that wrote the records, but they were food doctors and they were a dynasty and they intermarried and I'm sure the women had just as much to say about the food and whatnot and uh, running the whole show on the island of Kos and uh, the different healing sanctuaries that they had. So the idea of Hippocratic medicine is, is that we don't know what disease is, we don't know how drugs or herbs work. <laughs> If they're American Indians, they know, but they were Greek, so we didn't know that. And we don't know, uh, don't know how disease works. We don't know how, um, how uh, herbs work and what other facet. We don't know how the body works. So what are we going to do? We, we need one technique that works for all people, no matter what. Yeah, sure. Okay. Oh, well, they figured that out. Fast for two weeks or a week even and detoxify, period. And their fast is a, not a complete total fast, but just, well, basically it'd be like an elimination diet where you eliminate the things you're allergic to and the bad foods, and there's lots of bad foods out there. You just eat kind of pure, simple foods. I would say, I, I always think of it as kind of like having tabbouleh salad for a week, you know, which like, except maybe there's no grain in it, you know. <laughs> and, um, so, yeah, which sounds great, except that after a couple of days, like, yeah, I want something other than to move. But period, <laughs> something very. So you detoxify because you take a burden off the body. It doesn't need to hold in that thing, and and it, and it starts to detoxify, and it hits that crisis. And it was right at that point then the Hippocratic physicians they did not diagnose because they didn't know what was going on in the body. They didn't know what the drugs did. They didn't know, you know, they had this one technique. So right at that crisis, what did they do? They prognosticated. So there's a book on, on prognosis. Will the person die? Is this, do, do they have enough? Are they not from maybe the remedy, but like detox by phlegm, oh, they're going to be better. Detox by diarrhea, yellow bile. Yeah, it's harder, but they're going to get better. Uh, detox by bleeding. Well, they're going to have to detox some more. This is not detox by the black blood. That's even worse, but you know. And then by that point, you can start to realize they have ways of determining if the person has cancer or whatnot. So they're prognosticating, but they're using that healing crisis. So that's the no in the art, the healing crisis. And even they look for the signs, what's going to happen? What is no one do? All the black birds go off, no, don't bring any signs back, then the doves come back. So the doves come back. Give them science. There's land, the olive branch, eh? and uh, so, um, so, and so then after the flood, then he settles down, he builds a vineyard, and he gets drunk. Oh, plants are still up to this joke. <laughs> so, um, so then we pass on to the story. So, the, the, so those are the three principles of healing, and I do go over this in the book in the. Six, seven or six herbs? No, seven. <laughs> uh, so, like treats like or opposite to opposite, um, but not suppression. That's what modern medicine is. Okay, that's number one. 
first law of healing. Second is uh, law of direction of cure from inside to outside in that top to bottom, but the bottom the less vital. Law of the healing crisis. Those are the first, those are the major laws of, of healing with herbs, homeopathy, with anything really. Because like if you're doing massage, like you're still, you're like, first of all, if you do it right, you're sympathizing with the organism or you're warming up where they're cold. I don't know that you're cooling off where they're hot, but but maybe you're dispersing heat, you're dispersing cold, or you're figuring out where there's lumps of toxins and you are releasing that. And so you're sympathizing and opposing at some points. You're doing that initial dance of the right remedy, even by hand there. And then the person starts to detoxify. So, or like something like a lymphatic massage, that's like whole body lymphatic. That really releases the toxins. That's one of the most effective but arduous methods there. So all these healing, healing, how to heal, versus suppression, that's regular medicine. And if I may digress for a moment, it just gets worse and worse what I think regular medicine does. It's just more and more unbelievable. So like when they test a drug, we want a new drug for this or that. Like it has to be better. It has to work more than 27% of the people in the, in the thousand people on placebo, a thousand people take the drug, 270 get better. That's placebo. That doesn't come. If they need to get 5% above that, they need 320 people get better. 50 people got better. We got a drug. We can sell it. The FDA will believe in it. Yeah. Who cares about all those uh, side effects? That doesn't matter. We'll write them all out in the person, you know. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Smallest typeface in the world. <laughs> um, so, and then every once in a while, we'll just declare that we know best and you got what we want to do. We'll make up a, uh, it will take three months to do 20 years of research. But um, let's see. So so those are the three um, uh, basic principles. So then the other four, they're my favorite for the shamanic side. So Abraham, Abraham called from his hometown. Um, Haran, which is in West. I had a friend who went there and she said, yeah, they have the well there where Jacob met uh, Rebecca, where Abraham left. And yeah, yeah there's like pop cans and stuff down in the bottom of it. It was like kind of a mess. It wasn't a national park. And that's the that's where the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims all came from that beginning there with Abraham. But Abraham walked, faith, faith, always having to give up more and more, and never, never never fulfilled, and then finally, you know, and then finally sac sacrifice your son, oh, okay, yes, here I am, I'll do it. And then finally, yeah, um, on Mount Moriah, Mount Moriah, um, Moriah, like that, that means mountain of see, yeah, that, the word just means seeing, vision, or provision. That's interesting. So it's where he sees. The mountain where he's, but it's also the mountain where he's seen. Your need has been seen. We'll provide a animal for the sacrifice instead of your son. This is also like at this moment, you Hebrews are separate from uh, other people that sacrifice children because they didn't do that. No longer will you do that. But it doesn't say that. It's not. It's really the whole commandments thing. That's like later. It's like. It's all through inner meaningful stories and symbols. From now on, that's no longer part of your practice. So, but he sees the ram, but it's seeing too, so seeing. And I can tell you, so, um, so in shamanism, when you dream of your animal self, that means your eyes open up on the inner plane. So, uh, I'll tell my own story and then I'll tell Susan, you've met Susan. <laughs> right? Uh, and, yeah. 
You, you met Susan. Oh, yes. yes, yes, memorable. She's got those alligator eyes, yeah. But uh, I'll tell her story first. So she's at the uh, Galactic Peace Conference at the center of the galaxy. All the different races of the whole galaxy are gathered there. And she said, and let me tell you, us humans are pretty boring. <laughs> and and uh, they've got their little booths and everything. And then in the distance comes this column, the king of the alligators leading bows and alligators, like walking on two legs, come up to her booth. And uh, this is king of the alligators looking at her. And she said, have you ever felt the calm of fear? of terror. I said, well, no. <laughs> and so she's concerned. She's not concerned about herself. That would not be like her. So she's concerned about humans. So she says, get the gun. And then immediately she's strung up on poles up above the whole, the, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a black Subaru out back. Sorry. The recording it will be available. <laughs> <laughs> so um and there's being Minnesotans, we all have jumper cables too. So. <laughs> but uh let's see. So silent and terror. Yes. Have you ever felt the calm of terror? Oh. Well, uh, no, no, actually, no. Um, <laughs> and um, and then she, so she strung up on it, you know, all the people, well, they're all looking at her like, and she's like, oh, I really blew it. It's a peace conference. Oh, yeah, well, you so <laughs> <laughs> They let her down. And uh, they, um, uh, and so she says, I got to give a present to the king of the alligators to make up for that. So a big ruby next was, and she brings it to where it's the court of the king of the alligators and all surrounded by his elders, like 20, 30 alligators, boys. And uh, this one was in a, walking back and forth with a snake tail sticking out from under her dress. Like, kill her, kill her. And Susan brings it. And the uh, king of the alligators isn't very impressed. And he says, if you pull a gun, you better use it. <laughs> and and, um, and that and the snake lady screams, "Kill the bitch!" and she wakes up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he, she was going out with a guy then, and a week later he dreamed that she merged up out of a lake, half woman, half alligator, <laughs> and they never went out again. <laughs> and Susan concluded. So, just when you think this stuff is all a bunch of crap, it ruins your sex life. <laughs> so, yeah, you dream of your medicine animal. Yeah. And the reptiles, they don't give you. A, a, so, you get a lucid dreaming after that. The reptiles don't, they don't have emotional content to the dreams as much. It took her a long time to develop that so yeah i dreamed of the wolf or people think i'm more of a bear but i don't know wolf side of the lord of the underworld his face is just a blackness though so i want you to meet one of my captains big bad, big bad wolf standing next to a light post in the inner city <laughs> what do we got here a predatory look <laughs> uh, i don't know um <laughs> and uh uh, Lord of the Underworld said, and now we will make a psychic link between you and the wolf being. Wait, no, I, I, I've been studying occultism and shamanism. I don't want some familiar spirit in the underworld. No, please. Boom, too late. No. In fact, it was a little bit like that picture on the cover of the book. I guess I hadn't thought of it that way. That's that's William Blake's picture of the Elohim creating Adam. No, no. So that's, that's a great picture. And and it really is a good rendering of it. It's really fit. It really matches his picture, which I saw in the Tate Museum in oh. yeah in London. Very fortunate. And his works are, I mean, they're really interesting in books. But in person, 
Because, you know, the old artists, they paint layer upon layer upon layer. And, and his paintings are like that, like the old masters. Even though he couldn't, he wasn't quite as perfect at rendering as it was. So, but so that animal, and then that's when you begin to lose a dream. Later on. It's because your animal self is no longer getting in the way. Up to that time, nightmares and things, they say, why, oh, that's another good story. Why should you, it's like nightmares are your animal self saying, no, no, don't go there. Don't, don't abuse psychic energy. Don't, like, step, step over that boundary. Like, or that other person, get out of our space. The animal self protects you, but it's more unconscious. Yeah, here I get to tell another story. So, so years ago, I was teaching, and a few of you might have been down at Bonnie Raitt's at this conference in uh, in southern Minnesota, where we had we had great conferences there. We had such great times in the old days of herbal medicine, magical, crazy things happening. And as as uh, Martin and I were reminiscing in old days at present moment or herbs, it was just like crazy things would happen. What? And, uh, but so, um, uh, so. Um, but first, I was teaching at Jim McDonald's in Detroit area. Great teacher, good guy, good herbalist. And I was teaching, and I said, oh, and I went on an herb walk with Jim, and he taught us that uh, the outer, the inner um, leaves of the, uh, of the um, mullen. mullen, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the inner leaves of the mullen are for uh, relaxing the nerves and the outer leaves give you nightmares. And <laughs> thanks Jim for teaching me that. He says, I never taught you that. <laughs> and I, honestly, I have this whole vision of being on Urbach and he's teaching me. That's the way Mullen is. And it, it plants memories. And so actually the real memory was I was at a different year at Bonnie Ray, Bonnie Ray, Bonnie. Crack out, yeah, no, funny, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know that that farm on Cityfield where I lived. Actually, Bonnie Raitt and a bunch of musicians uh, recorded one of her early songs there, or several in in that guest house there. Um, yeah, so I've been told. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I knew one of the musicians. I mean. He was more of a West Banker than he was a West Minotaur person. But uh, so, um, but so, Bunny Krakow's, yeah, so I was, it was like 7.30 in the morning, it was pouring, lightning striking, and he had his, his herb walk was scheduled then, and I was like, Jim, I'm not going to go on the herb walk. You know? <laughs> so that was the reality, was I never went on the herb walk. But I remembered all that. <laughs> so, I'm teaching at Bonnie Creek House, and it was more towards the Root River out there, um, west of Mana of of, of um, Monona. and um, uh, I and I taught that, and this woman in the audience said, "I'm a witch," and we use, and that's what we we say that the the, um, the leaves to the outside are graveyard dust. Uh, Leaves on the inside are, are the part we use for medicine. It's like, well, why would you give? Why would you give someone oh, graveyard dust for giving people nightmares? It's like, why would you do that? I was kind of like, but really, if you're teaching people, training them on that level, you want to wake up their animal self. You want to give them nightmares if they're transgressing. So very subtle, yeah. So no, I haven't tried it, but <laughs> but I have. Oh, um, you guys might watch this like. I never, does anybody ever notice this? Uh, just this year, I picked um, some mullen, and right next to the stem, the spore, you break the leaf off there. It's purple. Has anybody ever seen that? It's purple. You have leaves, yeah. I mean, it's not like a little bit purple, it's like bright purple. It's like a acrylic paint or something. So there's some, that means something. That's kind of a occult color. Well, yeah, it's not the plant isn't toxic, so no toxin from the ground. Oh, yeah, there's some something there. Um, it may have something to do with that dreaming and all that because I mean, a plant's good dreams, it 
but you can have nightmares. I mean, it's really a modulator of dreams. So, so we have Abraham, then we have um, Isaac. I'll get back to him. Then we have Jacob. He has to, like, he's fighting all the time. He's not giving up. He's grabbing hold. So when he's born, he's grabbing his brother's foot, Esau, as he comes out of the mother's womb. And, and so he's grabbing, grabbing. Oh, hey, brother, I'll buy your, I'll buy your, your inheritance. Yeah, your inheritance for, for, a, for a bowl of soup here. Yeah, yeah, I'll take it. Like, like, Esau is like Hercules. And and when I was in yeah I was in this is one thing that got me interested in this whole thing I was in the, the Quaker Sunday school when I was about twelve ten and my dad was a teacher and he said most nations in the world they trace their descent from Hercules from the brother who was Hercules but the Jews trace their their descent from uh, from the little scrawny brother who like grabbing all the time. <laughs> and, uh, my dad was an aunt. I said my mom was a Jew, so she, he had the right to talk about it. But so so I thought, wow. So I always thought about that. So indeed, so so Esau, it's like on a certain place on the shamanic on the spiritual path, because it could just be called spiritual path too. At a certain point, um the um, I was going to say, I get a little tired here. Uh, what was I talking about? At a certain point, forget it. No. The, the what? The grass people. Yeah, okay. Um, at a certain point, the Hercules part has to be separated out. The kind of pure Hercules, like Esau is actually a really good guy. It's like he, like when they reunite later on, they make peace. He like grabs, he's mad at Jacob all these years, but Jacob kind of arranges and gives, kind of appeals to his human self. And, and he grabs Jacob and he cries and he forgives him, although he asks exactly, where's your boundary now? Like I'm on this side, you're on that side. So he does, he has learned enough <laughs> not to trust his brother infinitely, but he cries, but Jacob doesn't cry. So there's something very sincere and real about Esau, but that's not for this, but that's like the lesson is that Jacob to calculating the warrior, the spiritual warrior always, and he's the one. So he's come back to face his demons, that is his brother, and he's betrayed and he comes up to the river and he sets his camp down, all his followers, his family, and he goes on, fights with the, fights with the supernatural being all night and before dawn the being says uh, 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 says uh, let go and he grabs hold let go let go just before sun comes up so a very worldwide type of theme he says no no I won't until you bless me by what name do men call you uh, Yaakov he who grabs by the heel men shall no longer call you that but Yisrael prince before God, or he who sets troops in order before God, or a uh, spiritual warrior. So that's the meaning of Israel originally. So he's reborn in a way. Um, and so letting go, that's Abraham, and grabbing hold, that's Jacob, and in between is Isaac, which, boy, you get a rest every once in a while on the spiritual path of the path of life. So that's Vision and provision. He's just provided for him. Oh, okay. There's a spring in the desert here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, you need a wife. Oh, oh, I see her in the distance. Oh, okay. There she is. <laughs> oh, we haven't had any kids. Oh, 20 years. Oh, okay. Let's have some kids. Oh, oh twins. Oh, okay. More than enough. Yeah. So, uh, and so he, he has that vision, but in the end, he becomes blind. Isaac becomes blind. That's because it's not enough just vision, evidently. It's the lessons here. We go into. Jacob and Joseph, Joseph really is interpretation to know how it all fits together and to rise above it all and to truly be not injured by being put upon and sold into slavery as in this case. So Isaac, um, yeah, so I like Isaac the most. That's the sit and rest, 
and like we do need rest. <laughs> so yeah, it doesn't happen. He's the fifth day down the seventh, but we need rest on the, on the fifth day and the seventh. So, <laughs> so um and uh and then finally J Joseph he dreams he's I will I'm gonna rule over all my brothers. You asshole and she's like do you gotta say it? Like <laughs> like yeah, our father likes you best, but like you gotta like rub it in our faces and, like so he wears the coat of many colors. That's the beauty of the soul. That already came up, that was the rainbow and uh, no on the ark, the rainbow and the clouds, the soul is accepted. It's okay to be this flawed human crazy critter that's you know goes to the goes to the center of the the, the galaxy and gets out a gun. <laughs> <laughs> He's got that stuff. All oh, those humans. Oh my God. <laughs> They're at it again. So, yeah. Uh, so, Joseph then becomes, it rises to the top no matter what point it's going to go. Uh, and he's the dreamer. His dreams, he interprets dreams. He knows how to do that. His counterpart is not his wife, but Tamar. She's a, she's a strategic warrior. She has that quality, and she defeats um, Judah, who represents the ego, and is just like totally me, me, me. I don't care about spiritual law. I'll do it my way. Just as the he lives in a town called Justice of the People. Yeah, well, we'll make up our own laws. Yeah. So, so that's those seven stories, and. I did find herbs that match them, and I still have not really found very many different herbs that could replace those initial herbs in the Seven Herbs book. Although sagebrush, I always use wormwood instead of sagebrush. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I found, I will say, Yerba Santa over the years has become more and more valuable because it really does. I, I say that in the book, um, that it's for uncovering something that's not fully developed, it's mysterious that you don't understand about the case or the person doesn't understand. Have you guys seen that at all? Or not, not yet. I've only kind of come to rely. I'm just going to turn to the Yeah. Particularly the flower essence. Yeah, the flower essence, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it helps to reveal what is hidden, you know, um, which is handy because you don't always know it all. And, and you think you do. <laughs> Because we're flawed human beings. The stickiness of it much more gravitatively. Yeah. Yeah. It sticks. Yeah. It's an interesting yeah. plant. It really grows in dry, damaged places. And like the road cut in California where there's nothing, you know. <laughs> there's barely any rain. Yeah. Okay. So, so, uh, what's the time now? Just so. Uh, it's 824. So, oh, okay. So, questions, comments, memories, dreams, reflections, memories. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, Easter Lily is the first one, and that is really openness to it's like, as I always say, it's like beautiful, it's a purity type symbol, but it's genitals are sticking way out. It's, good. it's kind of, it's uh, in the book, I said, the non horror complex, but it's more generalized than that. And actually, the ancient Chinese doctor who relied on Chang, Chang, Ching, he describes how the person is conflicted, like they want the opposite. They want opposites all the time, and they're hard to please. Chamomile is kind of like that, but Easter Lily, Easter Lily, and as I say, it's still a great uh, cyst remedy, female cyst remedy, or anywhere where there's a cyst. Yeah. And then the second one, Yerba, Yerba Santa, to bring it to the surface, the law of direction of cure, to reestablish that perhaps would be a good way to put that. In homeopathy, they use sulfur for that. And then the law of the healing crisis, uh, Iris. Now, I've discovered a lot since writing that book, which is Iris to me is one of the several remedies for leaky gut. It's the one I know the best for that. So, actually, that's the integrity of the psyche. That's that the alchemical boss, the ship. So it's the integrity of the membrane. There's probably other membranes too involved. I don't understand the membranes totally, but off 
often uh, that's a remedy. Let's see. For as a thyroid remedy, and to remember Matthew Els spoke in that church, and he's the one who really taught me about um, iris as a thyroid remedy. Iris has up and down, um, hyper thyroid, hypo, hyper, hypo, and that turns out to be related to the sneaky gut. That they're they're like like the food comes, the liver has to be the Meta, the digestive system as well as the metabolic and then the thyroid has to go up and then it crashes and the and the um, blood sugar crashes so iris has that integrity quality but iris the rainbow iris is the goddess of the rainbow and so associated with with Noah the beauty of the soul um oh well, we gotta get Dennis some um, Dennis Anderson here. So, yeah, it's been a long time. He's in Durand, Adobe, Wisconsin. But here's a story. I still can't help but tell all the stories. So he grew up on a farm and they slaughtered animals when he was young on the farm. They don't do that. And he said, Yeah, when they took the liver out, it like shined. It was iridescent, like an iris. It was iridescent, like in the sun. And I knew, and and it, and he learned from that when he was an adult, when he was a when he was a healer, that the liver is full of of metals, iron, copper, and zinc, that make those make it shine, and it's really important that way, and um, uh, to keep the min minerals in good supply is good for the liver. Oh, okay. Well, Iris, yeah, the um, letting go, well, surviving hard experience. That's Sagebrush or wormwood, I would use nowadays. Um, the visionary plant, I wish it was something more common, but it's a plant called cat's ears, a lily that grows in um, coastal California and Oregon. I finally saw, saw it. I have some else make the flower house inside. I finally saw the plant. It truly is beautiful. And it, the cat's ears to hear. He sends the other world like I was able to see it. Um, and then Jacob grabbing hold, uh, learning uh, black cohosh. Black cohosh, they have to, they actually have to learn to let go. Grab their, their. First of all, it's like bunching up with cerebral spinal fluid, like whiplash and problems, dark state of mind, and you have to let go and let go. Well, it makes sense. <laughs> uh, and then the final one, lady slipper, which is rare. If you can make flowers in the sense way or get one, that's got a lot to do with that plan. That's like the mantle of authority and responsibility. You've completed your lessons. You like earned the award at the end. You became the chief magistrate for the pharaoh. Um, you did end up ruling over all your brothers. <laughs> and uh, Lady Slipper, um, yeah, that one came to me, and I still don't understand it totally, I'd have to say. Yeah, and I would also say that the seven song taught me, well, or Michael Tierra, actually, if you just want an orchid, see it's an orchid, to like supplement, to like tonify the nerves that androbia which I have. I don't know. Why, Jean? I don't know. Yeah. If, yeah. What? Oh. I just gotta watch for that. Yeah, yeah. I'm afraid I'm gonna miss it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, someone would bring it home, I'm sure. But... Someone who's going to Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Are there any of them? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, let's see, so, um, uh, yeah, to build the nervous system up again, that dendrobium. I don't know, have you used it much? Or it's, I don't even know if it's in the yeah, door now. Mostly, yeah. More, mostly, you've used the essence, yeah, though. It's very much about the energy coming through, oh. circling through the whole nervous system. And, and from above. From yeah. above, connected to the ground, and out the reverse direction. Let's, let's end the. Uh, um, any other good questions? One more. No, good, okay.
we'll end where we really should end, which is the energy coming down from above, the, the, the spiritual awareness going through our body and issuing out through our feet and anchoring us on the ground. And I was about a year and a half, two years ago, I was reading Dr. Christopher, or I was listening to him on a tape, and he said, uh, when you have headaches and constipation, you need to walk on the earth. You are receiving your directions, but you're not discharging them. You're not grounding them. And you've got to actually walk on the earth. And it was like, oh, really? I have headaches and I, or was it, oh, insomnia. No, insomnia and constipation. Yeah, it wasn't headaches, but it could have been. And maybe that is true too. But insomnia, mental overactivity, and um, constipation. So I walked on the earth and wow, right away I was better. <laughs> so, um, but I wonder, yeah, Lady Slipper might help with that. Yeah. Yeah. They get yeah. stuck at any part of the part of the yeah. Wow. Yeah. wow. Okay. I think we're all getting stuck all the time on that one. Yeah. And uh, I kind of feel in this um, whole COVID type era we've entered in, which is like, and war and just on and on like stress. Like, oh, our plate is full. No, here's another bunch of plates. No, it's really, it's too much. Um, we got to keep that connection to the above and that groundedness to the earth and we keep on going. So we'll end with that. But <laughs> Well, I will be available here for a while, uh, like ride permitting, um, or how oh, did they have to close, um, to sign books, either ones uh, that I brought or um, any that you brought to. So, yeah. So, thank you. So much, thank you. Uh, Tennis minutes on the auction items. So if you are the winning bidder of the beautiful item, Yeah, I took it. I had a. I got shot in the head with a bee. I was riding my bike, and he took it out. He had that big man. 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 He had that big we dug around and got that beam in. Like a little mother bear or something on your bike. I know, I do have one. Hey, could you see me? Oh,
Yeah, I I'm not going to leave her in the budget. Yeah. Harvesting stuff. 